These days, you hear a lot about there being a war on Christmas, which is kind of weird, right? Since every year in the U.S., we are swamped with public light displays, parades, carols, nativity scenes, plus enough Christmas marketing campaigns to choke a reindeer. Heck, even in Hong Kong, where Rob lives, where only 12% of the population is Christian, Christmas is absolutely everywhere. So if there is a war on Christmas, a simple happy holidays isn't exactly going to stem that tide because the holiday is definitely winning. But what if I told you that a local American government actually banned Christmas entirely, where hanging a wreath, singing carols, or going on a Christmas Eve service would get you fined, and where you were required to go to work on Christmas Day? Well, that government was the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which passed an act against observing Christmas, or any other holiday, in 1659. And they weren't alone in doing so. Because in the 1640s, the Puritan-dominated Parliament in England and their fellow Calvinists in Scotland also banned Christmas, leading to riots, propaganda, and yes, contributing to a real, actual war. Thanks so much to Factor for keeping us history-loving beans well-fed fast this busy holiday season. Okay, Matt, you're probably saying, just why did the Puritans go to war against Christmas? Kinda sounds like a losing proposition, right? I mean, Christmas is too likable, too charismatic, and most importantly, too profitable. Come to think of it, it kinda feels to me like the 1600s equivalent of going to war with Taylor Swift. Politicians take note, not a great plan. But seen from their perspective, the Puritan case against Christmas made a decent amount of sense for them. To many 17th century Calvinists, like the English Puritans and the Scots Presbyterians, Christmas represented everything they wanted to eliminate from both worship and society at large. You see, their primary rejection of Christmas was theological. Puritans believed that the Bible was the literal word of God, and that any religious practice without scriptural basis was an illegitimate, worldly, and corrupt practice. To them, these unscriptural practices were twisting God's law, which were wrongly tolerated by the Church of England. This, of course, meant things like saints, popes, and transubstantiation, but also all holy days, or holidays, apart from the Sabbath. After all, no one celebrates Christmas or Easter in the Bible, so Puritans didn't either. According to one famous Puritan saying, there could be no holy days for a man who believed every day was holy. But Christmas was set out for special condemnation by the Puritans, partially because it, to them, seemed particularly Catholic. After all, Christmas literally means Christ's Mass, and they considered every ritual associated with it, from Christmas Eve to Advent to Epiphany and the figure of Father Christmas, a version of Saint Nicholas, as sordid popish symbols. And that last one was bad, because Puritans hated Catholics, who had repressed the group both in England and on the continent, giving them a neurotic paranoia about anything that resembled the Roman Church. And that included the Church of England, which had kept many Catholic-style rituals. In fact, the pilgrims who'd left to found Plymouth were not so much seeking religious freedom as they were fleeing to find a colony where they were free to not tolerate other religions. Yet, if there was anything Puritans detested as much as Catholicism, it was practices they considered pagan. And medieval Christmas had those in spades. See, Puritans were extremely aware that as Christianity spread, its holidays had picked up elements of local pre-Christian festivals, such as decking the halls with plants and burning yule logs. Similarly, they pointed out that the date of Christmas had supposedly been picked in Roman times to compete with the Roman festival of Saturnalia, and that Jesus would not have been born in December. In fact, the holiday had so little to do with Christianity, they actually nicknamed it Fool's Tide, to demean anyone practicing it. In addition, British Christmas was, how do I put it, um, a little much. Back then, Christmas was loud. Christmas was celebrated in the streets. And everyone got really, 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 really drunk. This was medieval-style Christmas, before it was toned down. There was holly and gift-giving and feasting, sure but also massive displays of chaos. Rolling parties surged down the streets, and groups of poor subjects would engage in wassailing, the highly violent origin of Christmas caroling. So check this. Intoxicated mobs would go from house to house, singing songs and insisting that they be invited inside for food, gifts, and more booze. If you didn't comply, they might throw cobblestones through your windows or break in and steal stuff anyway. So that carol lyric, we won't go until we get some, was very, very literal. Actually, on that note, a lot of people were also getting some in another sense. Because it turns out that Christmas hookups weren't invented by the Hallmark Channel. Christmas was a time for wild merriment, where a peasant would be crowned the Lord of Misrule and give nonsensical orders everyone had to follow. 
For a few days, servants would act like masters and vice versa, men would dress as women, people would dress as animals, and of course, all of this revelry and cross-dressing made it pretty easy, for example, for a woman to slip into a group of men and steal a little time for a liaison with her lover. Gambling was also a favored holiday pastime, and in this atmosphere, brawls were nearly inevitable. And one major target of violence? Puritan businesses that refused to close on Christmas, opening as if it was a normal day. The point is that between all of the chugging and slugging, yoinking and boinking, feasting and beasting, a lot of English elites, not just the Puritans, were thinking things had gotten out of hand. Especially since, remember, Christmas lasted 12 whole days, from Christmas Eve to Epiphany. So, in 1640, the Presbyterian Church in Scotland banned Christmas. Officially, this remained the case until 1956, and as a result, most of the holiday revelry moved to New Year's Eve, or Hogmanay, as the Scots call it. However, the English Puritans couldn't defeat Christmas so easily. In 1642, Puritan members of Parliament, leveraging a budget crisis to squeeze concessions out of King Charles I, managed to push through legislation that called for a day of prayer and fasting on the last Wednesday of the month. This didn't go well for a number of reasons. Firstly, standoffs like this would go increasingly bad, leading to a series of civil wars between Parliament, Royalists supporting Charles, and the Scots. Second, it set the stage for a clash over Christmas. On Christmas in 1643, rioters struck Puritan businesses that opened on the day, and in 1644, with Parliament in control of London and Christmas falling on the monthly fast day, Parliament announced that Christmas was cancelled. Not only did they ban Christmas, but also Christmas Eve services, decorating with holly, wassailing, pies, plum pudding, or any outward symbol of the holiday. People resisted the ban, quietly gathering to celebrate in homes or public houses, transforming the holiday into a more intimate affair between friends and family rather than the whole community. But that didn't mean there still weren't occasional explosions of violence, the worst of which came on Christmas Day 1647 in Canterbury. There, the mayor went to the market square to force local shops to open and was met by an unruly crowd of 500 people determined to make the season merry and bright. They descended, sacking every shop that opened and pushing the mayor down in the gutter. Then, after he got back up in his muddy, torn robes and ordered them all to disperse, they did something even worse, kicking off, quite literally, a highly destructive Christmas tradition. They played football. But not soccer as we know it. No, no, no. The old medieval football, which was essentially a riot with a ball involved, played on city streets. They flooded through Canterbury, yelling, CONQUEST! and singing raucous carols while kicking, heading, and throwing balls back and forth. They ripped up bushes and forcibly decorated houses, and of course got really, really drunk. What would come to be known as the Plum Pudding Riot actually marked a turning point in the English Civil Wars, because the trial of the rioters the next year turned into a political football. And though the defendants were acquitted, the anger over the prosecutions again filled the streets. This time, the violence turned into a full-on uprising, part of a tide of pro-royalist insurrections in 1648 that showed resistance to parliamentarian rule was nowhere near over. The next year, in fear of further royalist uprisings, King Charles lost his head. But Christmas resistances continued, with pro-holiday pamphlets arguing for reviving the celebration and its place in Christianity. Christmas remained banned in England until 1660, when the Puritan-led Commonwealth fell, and Charles' son, Charles II, was invited to take the throne on behalf of the deposed Stuarts. And there are historians who argue that moves like the banning of Christmas did contribute to the fall of Puritan rule, because people like their parties. Again, never fight Tay-Tay. Yet, in a way, the Puritans won as well. For English Christmas would never be as raucous as it was before the ban, and celebrations moved inside of the home. However, in colonial America, Christmas would remain illegal until 1681, but even after the act was repealed, celebrations were still generally private. Congress met on Christmas in 1802, and it wasn't until 1870 when President Grant made it a public holiday, officially declaring an end to the war on Christmas. It's over, y'all. And, you know, to celebrate this momentous moment in history, I've decided I'm not going to do dishes until the new year. And thanks to Factor, I can make that holiday dream a reality. Factor is my absolute favorite ready-to-eat meal delivery service that I've been subscribed to for over a year now so that I never have to worry about what's for lunch or dinner. Each meal is ready in two minutes with no prep, no mess, and my favorite, no cleanup, just great food whenever I have time to eat it. It seriously is that simple. Every week, I get to review their rotating menu and pick whatever I'm feeling from all of their mouth-watering meals and add-on options. Ooh, hello, cold 
compressed juices, and they really do have so many options to choose from, I can be sure that everyone in my household is gonna get the food that they love fast. Case in point, I just devoured their tomato basil chicken risotto, and straight up, it rivaled a few of my favorite Italian restaurants that I will not be putting on blast here. And with all the time I saved, I was able to stay on schedule and get all of my EC work done before our holiday break. Damn, I'm good. And you can get your first Factor box for 50% off at factor75.com by clicking the link below and using the code extra credits 50 to activate that delicious deal. So for fast and flavorful meals from Factor, click here. And once dinner's done, check out our next Jemmy YouTube video here. The biggest beam thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angelo Valenciana, Arcalite Games, Dominic Valenciana, Izzy Coin, Joseph Blame, Kuyakoy, and Michael Hoggett for being our legendary patrons.